everyone. Uh, Brother Perry and him's out honeymooning or anniversary, whatever you want to call it. And that's all right. Everybody needs to get away every once in a while, I guess. I know we do. And, but he's asked me to teach this week. And we'll do the best we can. And it's going to be a little different from what I normally do, but and, um, I just hope I, I do what I, I'm, I'm right in what I say. But and uh, that's the main thing. Just I want to be good and, and uh, uh, don't want to say anything wrong. That's the main thing today. But we'll just get our start in uh, Matthew 11 and 11. Just going to read that one verse and just give us a starting point. Didn't really know where to start with this one. No. But uh, it's just a little starting point before we before we get into the lesson there. Uh, before we start, Brother Doyle, you lead us in prayer. Your blessed heaven, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, this beautiful day. Yes, yes, sure. yes thank you, Lord. Well, I like the church. No, no better place where we can be here this morning. Right. I just thank you the place, Lord, you've given us to come worship you. And I pray that you bless Brother Wayne as he speaks from the Word of God. Help us yes, all Lord, our hearts. Our heart. The scriptures and Jesus the mind of our lives. Our hearts help us to be Doers of the word, not hearers only. And again, I pray you bless the congregation and every need. So, Lord, the body of all the here. teachers and what they want to do. Touch your heart. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Doyle. Before I start, and if I say something wrong, y'all can let me know after church. A lot of y'all are a lot smarter than I am about this, but but if I say something wrong, just let me know after church, and we'll, we'll try to make it right. But uh, Matthew 11 and 11, just going to read this one verse, and it says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of woman, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And like I said, I didn't know where to start with this this morning. We're going to be looking at uh, the Baptist, uh, the uh, some distinctives, Baptist distinctives this morning, looking at what the Baptists believe or and uh, the Baptist churches, you know, they're different from other denominations or groups. And, you know, and, uh, we're different in our beginnings and our beliefs. And, you know, and only the Baptists can trace their, their history back to Bible times. The other denominations, they can't do that. Uh, you know, you got the Catholics and the Lutherans and people like that. They can't trace theirs all the way back to Jesus. And, but, uh, but the Baptists can. You know, and we may not always been called Baptists. You know, it may not be the name that's always been used but there's always been a group of, in every generation that have had the same doctrines that we hold today and uh, some like to mix us all together and call us protestants and things like that and uh, you know they put us in with the catholics and lutherans and uh, and others that that operate today but the baptists are not protestants you know uh, the protestants is someone that's protesting something that's that's left a divided away or, or protesting but but that's not what a baptist is you know because a baptist as i said can be traced back the roots can be traced back to the life of christ and uh now it brings us to these this baptist beliefs or distinctives as we're going to call them and uh you know we'll have, we'll have eight of them that we're going to be looking at and and uh and i'll, I'll read them first and, and and just read them all the way through and tell you about them now this is not something new to me. I, a guy, guy I work with, he gave me this uh, eight Baptist distinctives, and uh, I'll be using that. And uh, I'll be using also some of Brother Stanton Blues uh, out of his book as well in this as well. So, so we're going to read this first. It says eight Baptist distinctives. You know, it, it says it's very important to understand that not all Baptist folks worship in the same style. But all true Baptists believe in these eight Baptist distinctives. It is what makes us Baptists. These teachings may be remembered by associating them with the letters that form the word Baptist. The first one, it says, Biblical authority. The Bible is the final authority in all matters and belief and practices because the Bible is inspired by God and bears the absolute authority of God Himself. Whatever the Bible affirms, Baptists accept is true. No human opinion or decree or any church group can override the Bible. Even creeds and confessions of faith which attempt to articulate the theology of scriptures do not carry the scriptures inherent authority. And I have some scriptures with these, but we'll look at them later. We'll go back and look at these a little bit closer. Then the second one, it says, the autonomy of the local church. 
The local church is an independent body accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. All human authority for governing the local church resides within the local church itself. Thus, the church is autonomous or self-governing. No religious hierarchy outside the local church may dictate a church's beliefs or practices. Autonomy does not mean isolation, though. A Baptist church may fellowship with other churches around, around them are with mutual interest and in associational tie, but a Baptist church cannot be a member of any other body. Then the third one we'll be looking at later on this is the priesthood of the believer. Priest is defined as one authorized to perform the sacred rites of a religion, especially as a mediator agent between humans and God. Every believer today is a priest of God and may enter into his presence in prayer directly through our great high priest, Jesus Christ. No other mediator is needed between God and people. As priests, we can study God's word, pray for others, and offer spiritual worship to God. We all have equal access to God, whether we are a preacher or not. Then the fourth one we're looking at is two ordinances. The local church should practice two ordinances, baptism of believers by immersion in water, identifying the individual with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. And secondly, the Lord's Supper or communion, commemorating his death for our sins. Then the fifth one says individual soul liberty. Every individual, whether a believer or unbeliever, has the liberty to choose what he believes in is right in the religious realm. No one should be forced to assent to any belief against his will. Baptists have always opposed religious persecution. However, this liberty does not accept, exempt us from our responsibility to the Word of God or for accountability to God Himself. Then the sixth one is uh, the letter S, saved, baptized, church membership. Local church membership is restricted to individuals who give a believable testimony of personal faith in Christ and have publicly identified themselves with Him in believers' baptism. When the members of a local church are believers, a oneness in Christ exists, and the members can endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Then you have two offices in the local church. It says the Bible mandates only two offices in the church, pastor and deacon. The three terms pastor, elder, and bishop or oversee uh, overseer all refer to the same office. The two offices of pastor and deacon exist within the, lo within the local church, not as a hierarchy outside or over the local church. Then you got separation of church and state, the A.S. and Baptists. God established both the church and the civil government, and He gave each its own distinct sphere of operation. The government's purposes are outlined in Romans 13, 1-7 and the church's purposes in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Neither should control the other, nor should there be an alliance between the two. Christians in a free society can properly influence governments toward righteousness, which is not the same as denomination or group of churches controlling the government. Now, we'll, we'll look at them a little bit closer here now and, and, and see what we can see from each one of them. I just wanted to read them all to you before I started. But now the first one we'll be looking at is the biblical authority, or the B in Baptist. The Bible, you know, it's what directs our church, our church, our life. It is, as I said before, the final authority in all matters of belief and practice, and we believe that it is the inspired Word of God. And we do believe that King James was led by the Spirit to have this written down. You know, and what it's supposed to be here, what what it's supposed to be in there, it is, and what's not is not in there. You know, you hear of a lot of other books they supposedly found, but but they're not in the King James Bible. So that's what we go by, and that's what we believe. And, you know, this is the inspired Word of God, the King James Bible, sixteen eleven. It is by the authority of God Himself. What it says, we take as the truth, the way that God intended it to be. Some scripture to this. We see in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, it says in that from a child that has known the whole scriptures, which was able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We also see in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 13, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when we received the word of God, which we heard, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Then in 2 Peter 1 and 20, 1, 20 and 21, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy cannot in old time by the will of man, came not in old time by the will of man, but by holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We know that today that, that many people are trying to change the Bible. And, and in so doing, they're changing the authority of the Bible. You know, the, this is happening, also it's happening in some Baptist churches. We also see that in some of them as well. But the true Baptists, you know, they stay with the King James Bible, 1611. For we, we accept it, and we know that it, it is the Word, an inspired Word of God. So that's the B, there, the biblical authority. Then the second one we're looking at is autonomy of the local church. And the autonomy, it just means self-rule or independent. Um, it's independent body, body itself accountable to the Lord Jesus Christ the head of the church. You know, Baptists believe that the best way to govern a congregation is self-government without outside or religious boards or systems. You know, we as Baptists believe that the Holy Spirit will lead a church in the way to operate according to the principle of God, principles of God's Word. And you know, this is the way that Paul set up churches. He never set up a pope or a board of any kind to rule the local churches. You know, he worked as a missionary. He'd, he'd get a pastor, a local pastor to run a church. He'd have a pastor do that. And, you know, it's okay to have men that you can call on to help you out. Or, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that, but, but, you know, they're not to rule the church. Anybody else other than the local pastor, he's the one that rules the church or, or governs the church. We govern the church, but we have a local pastor to, to be over the church here. I guess is how you say it. But uh, they never had an association to rule over the church. And that's the way Paul set it up. You know, he left it up to the local church to pray to find the will of God and, uh, and then run the, way, run the church the way that they were led of the Lord. You know, the Catholics, they have their di diocese and the Pope and the Methodists have their conference and others have their conventions and, and uh, they have their associations and... Uh, but but that's not the way it's set up to be, and that's not the way it is with a true Baptist. And you know, and even some of the Baptists, you know, they've given up this liberty to be in a convention. You know, the Southern Baptists they they, they have the conventions, and but uh, but a traditional Baptist believes in the autonomy of the local church or the self governor and self rule of the local church. And again, I want to say it's okay to have that fellowship with other local churches. You know, we do that on Phil Sunday nights and. And that's okay. You know, they have the same beliefs and, and, and all that we do. And it's just an associated tie. It's not, it's not being a member of any other body. And that's okay. We have that fellowship with them. You know, and, uh, you know, and I'm glad to be a member of an independent Baptist church. That's, that's a good thing. Bible-believing church led by the Spirit of God, not by an association or not by somebody in Atlanta or, 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 or Calhoun or... Cleveland, Tennessee, or something like that. We don't want to be a. We don't want to be led by outside entities there, you know. And but some verses to support this, we find in Colossians one and eighteen, and it says, "And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the fir the firstborn from the dead." And this is talking about Christ, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And you know that's who should be over the church, Christ, not not some association. And then in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5, it says, Moreover, brethren, we do not you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how they in a great trial of afflictions, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I by record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us, with much entreaty that we would receive the gift 
and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry and the saints. And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Then in 2 Corinthians 8 and 19 it says, And, and not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us, with this grace which is administered to us, to the glory of the same Lord and decoration of your ready mind. And that just talks about the autonomy of the church, the local church, an independent church, a self-ruling church. And, you know, that's what we as Baptists believe in, the local church. Then the third letter, the priest, the, the P in Baptist, priesthood of the believer. You know, I, I, I read some of this a while ago, but it says a priest is someone is able to mediate, is to be a mediator agent between man and God. As a Christian, we all have may enter into his presence in prayer through Jesus. No other mediator is needed. We don't have to have someone else to pray to God for us. You know, we don't have to have a, a priest in that little room praying for us. But don't get me wrong, it's good to have others praying for us. I'm not saying we don't need to pray for each other. But it's not something that we have to have for our sins to be, given, be forgiven. You know, we can go to Christ any time and pray for ourselves. And, uh, you know, we also, we can study God's Word as well. And uh, we can worship too and have access to God through Jesus, whether we're a preacher or just a lay member. We all have the same ability to talk to God and, uh, and to seek His will and, and uh, pray for our own, own selves. You know, we don't just have to go to somebody else to do that. Like I said, it's good to have somebody to help us pray, but it's not necessary that, that we have somebody to pray for our sins. We can do that ourselves. And uh, some scriptures for this, we see in Peter, verses number 5 and verse number 9, it says, Ye all also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Then verse number 9, it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should shew forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, and that peculiar people, it just means a purchased people. We've been purchased by the blood of Christ. And then in Revelations 5, 9 and 10, it says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made unto us, made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So that's the priesthood. You know, everybody, I, that's just associating it. Everybody's able to, uh, to uh, talk to God on our own behalf, talk through Jesus. You know, we can pray for ourselves. And that's what I was talking about there, having, a, having the ability to talk to, talk to God. Then the fourth one we see, the T in Baptist, the two ordinances of the church. First we see baptism. And that just means to immerse, to immerse or to bury or put under. It's a way of identifying an individual with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. You know, but baptism, it's not for everyone. If, if you're lost, it's not for you. If you're a baby, it's not for you. You know, baptism is not for babies. And, you know, and it's not part of our salvation. We're first saved, then we're baptized. You know, it, it's for a born-again believer to identify themselves with Christ. In Acts 8, we can see with the Ethiopian eunuch, he asked Philip there, he says, uh, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Then in verse number 37, Philip says to him, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then they went down and baptized this Christian man. You know, he accepted Christ as Savior there, so he went down to be baptized. And that's the order that it's, it's supposed to be in. You know, in baptism, it also identifies the believer with the church as well. You know, and uh, as one who died out to the old life of sin and now walks in the newness of life. Romans 6, 3 through 6, it says, Now ye not, know ye not, that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, 
that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with, a, with Him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Then also in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, it says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And so the baptism, that's the first ordinance of the local Baptist church. Then the second order, ordinance of the church is the Lord's Supper or Communion. You know, this is commu commemorating His death for our sins. Baptists use the unleavened bread and unfermented juice of the vine. You know, and uh, I know some, they may use real wine to do this, but, but we, you know, we choose to use the, just the grape juice, what it amounts to, unfermented. And um, I have a guy that works with me. He talks about having it at his church. They didn't, when they have it, they'll use the... Uh, They'll, they'll use just grape juice because they're afraid if they use wine, some of those people that have drunk in the past may get the taste for it and want it again. But, but I, don't, you know, I don't think that's right. I don't think you should use it at all. So you just use it for, uh, use the grape juice because this is a symbolic measure. You know, the juice is a symbolic of the shed blood of Christ. And, and uh, the unleavened bread is symbolic uh, of his sinless body that was broken for us. And uh, scriptures that we can read for this is uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and uh, verses 23 through 32. We'll read them here. It says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood. This do ye oft, as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with this world. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's, you know, that's talking about the Lord's Supper. You know, we observe that twice a year here. So that's the, that's the two ordinances of the local church, the local Baptist church. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Then the fifth one, the I in Bap Baptist. It says the individual soul liberty. You know, and this simply means that, that everyone has a right to choose whether to be saved or not, and also to choose what is what to believe when they do come to, to accept Christ or get in religion, you might say, but, you know, they're not forced to follow in a certain way, but have the freedom to choose the way that they worship. You know, in Baptist, you know, we, we, we oppose religious persecution. However, this does not stop us from doing what is commanded uh, of us in the, in the Scriptures. You know, we're still, we're still held accountable to God for what we do and try to and try to reach others for Christ. You know, we have a desire to see others saved and uh, have a more perfect understanding of the Bible. And, uh, you know, I believe Jesus wants us to push forward with this effort. And, uh, and that's what we should do. We should try to reach others for Christ. But, you know, it's not... Everybody has that own ability to choose. You know, some some's going to choose not to be saved. Some, some like what they do. They don't want to get out of it. But, you know, we still have a responsibility to try to reach them for Christ. And, you know, some verses here that, that with this is Romans 5 and 12. It says, One man esteemeth one day above another, 
and another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Then in verse 12 it says, on, So then every one of us shall give account for himself of himself to God. Then another verse in 2 Corinthians 4 and 2, it says, But have, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Then Titus 1 and 9, it says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able to, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And you know, that's what we do. We try to convince them of what's right. But everybody still has their own choice. You know, Jesus didn't force himself on nobody. He gave everybody a choice. And, uh, and that's the way Baptists believe too. You, you have your own choice. You know, we may try to persuade you, but you do have your own choice. Then the S in Baptist. It talks about that saved, baptized church membership. This list in order of the way to join the local church. You know, first we've got to be saved. Have that experience of grace. Ephesians 2 and 8, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And uh, this is a way to be saved there. It talks about by grace through faith. You know, God by His grace convicts us through the Holy Spirit. Then we must respond by faith. You know, that faith is produced in the heart of a sinner through the preaching of the Word of God. Romans 10, 14 through 17 it tells, How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring great glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For as I says, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So grace through faith, it produces that salvation. And uh, I can't really leave this without talking. You know, we, we all know the, the doctrine of eternal security. And uh, Baptists are famous for this. You know, that's what we're known for, I guess. And uh, they're famous for that saying, once saved, always saved. But if you look at it, the biblical term, is eternal life or or eternal salvation, you know, whatever you want, something like that, whatever you want to call it. But but um, if you have that life, if you, it is the very life of the eternal God living in us right now, that's why it talks about that eternal salvation, eternal life. In Galatians two and twenty, it says, "I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, and yet not I, but Christ liveth in me." And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, we, we as Baptists would believe that when a person is saved, that they're saved forever. And uh, nowhere in the Bible does it talk about giving a conditional life to, to the saved. But it does speak of everlasting life. John 5 and 24, Brother David's favorite verse, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come in condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. It talks about that hath everlasting life. And it says also it shall not come in condemnation. So right there you have it, you have after everlasting life and you, you never be in condemnation again. Now we may sin, don't get me wrong, but, but we won't have condemnation. And then other verses as well. I won't take time to read these, but John 3, 15, 16, John 3 and 36, John 6 and 35 and 37, John 10, 27 through 29. And uh, that's some verses that, that tell that uh, eternal life, eternal salvation. A couple other verses, passages that, that we look at is Romans 8, 38 and 39. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
You can also read in Titus 3 and 5 and 7. Uh, we won't take time to read that. We're getting short on time here. But before we go on to the next one, let me just ask you one thing. Uh, are you trusting? What are you trusting in? That's what we're going to say. Are you trusting in baptism, church membership, or good works? Have you come to Jesus as a sinner with repentance and faith and received Him as your personal Savior? Have you received Jesus? Are you trusting in anything else besides Jesus? You're still lost in your sins. And uh, we all know that if, if you're trusting in anything else. And if, if you are, you, when you die, you're still going gonna to go to hell if you die lost and not trusting in Jesus. So, uh, and we've already talked about baptism. But to join the local Baptist church, you must be saved and baptized and then join the church. That's the order of things there. You must have that believable testimony of personal faith in Christ and publicly identify him, with Him in believer's baptism. And if you've been saved, you should want to become a member and attend the local church. As we read this morning, I was glad when it said, let's go into the house of the Lord. You know, if you're saved and, and you, you should want to go to be a member of a church. And some scriptures for this, and you, you go to Acts 2, 41 through 47, and uh, you can read them. And also in Ephesians 4 and 3, you know, it talks about that ende in endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You know, that speaks of being saved and baptized and joining the church. And let me get these other two here, the two offices, the T in Baptist. So, you know, the Bible has two offices in the local church. It says the pastors and the deacon. And uh, the term pastor, elder, bishop, or overseer all have the same office in the church. You know, the pastor is elected by the church. He's a called man of God. You know, not appointed by some council or some association, as we talked about earlier. But he's elected by the church, the local church, the members of the church. And um, the deacons, you know, they're appointed by the pastor. You know, their role is to help the pastor, not to run the church. A lot of churches, a lot of people feel like that's the, that's the uh, way to run the church, is the deacons should run the church. But that's not the way it is. And uh, we find the qualifications for a pastor and a deacon in 1 Timothy 3 and 1 through 13. I won't take the time to read them. Y'all can look at them. Y'all all know them. We all know them. That's, that's the way it is. But, but that's just uh, the qualifications for a pastor and a deacon. Then the last one we'll look at here is the separation of church and state. And uh, God established both the church and the civil government. And both have their own purposes, their own operation. And here in America, you know, we've taken that separation to the stream, it seems like. And, uh, you know, our government, it was based on the Bible. It was run, you know, that, that's how our, it was set up. It was based on the Bible and its principles. You know, they tried to take God completely out of our government and out of our public schools as well. Anything to do with the uh, government or public like that, they tried to take the Bible out of it. And they've replaced him with, uh, with terror and wickedness, immorality, greed, and lust. Then when you get, you get someone who tries to do right, tries to do better, uh, they, they fight him every step of the way. And we see that every day. And uh, the church and state should be separate, neither controlling the other. And uh, my time's up. Well, let me finish up re real quick here. It says, but as Christians, we should stop trying to influence the way way our country is run we should not shouldn't stop try stop trying to influence the way our country is run for we all know that you know if we had more christians our country would be more peaceable with each other you know even if with different denominations or beliefs uh people that go to church believe in their religion believe in religion tend to be more peaceable toward one another so we just it'd be better off to have more church people more saved people you know we, we have a lot more peaceable country people get along better and uh in matthew 18 18 through 28 18 through 20 we've already read it but it gives that as well and some verses for that you can read matthew 15 through 22 that's, that's some good verses here about the separation of church and state but and you know as christians we should we should try to still reach other people you know, I know we're trying to be separated from church and state, but and it's all right to try and influence our, influence our government in the right way to go, but 
but they do tend to want to take us completely out of it so we need to keep that in mind there and uh, and uh, I hope this was right I, I hope I, I told you right here if not y'all can tell me a little bit about it where I went wrong and we'll try to make it right next time but but I thank you for listening Brother Perry should be back next week